Hi, my name is Brent Burt, and I'm a biology professor at Stephen F. Austin State University. I'm recording a series of videos for my evolution class, Biology 370, and this will be the first out of a series of 20 videos uh, that I'm going to be posting to YouTube um, and available for whoever wants to watch them. All right, so this lecture is going to be basically just introductory information about what evolution is all about. So let's start off with some definitions. <clears throat> Evolution, um, Darwin described it as descent with modification. Um, and that really does summarize the process of uh, generation after generation. You have ancestors giving rise to descendants, but those descendants are modified. They're not exactly like their ancestors. Interesting, Darwin didn't use the term evolution um, in his famous book on the origin of species until the very end. A more modern uh, definition of evolution is genotypic and associated phenotypic changes in lineages through time. And again, the time reference here is a minimum of a generation time. And so that's going to vary between something like bacteria or viruses. Um, and organisms that have different life histories uh, with much slower uh, uh, maturation periods and uh, elongated uh, generation time. So something like a, a human, we're talking about a couple of decades between generations. Uh, and again, bacteria, it could be um, within just 30 minutes. But in all cases, these organisms have an ancestor uh, descendant relationship that leads to gradual modifications and that process is we'll see as microevolution that over the long term can produce these phylogenetic trees that uh, show you the divergence of different major lineages and the characteristics of those lineages. But as I mentioned, Darwin never actually uses the term evolution in his book on the origin of species until the very end. And the last two paragraphs state, it's interesting to contemplate an entangled bank clothed with many plants of many kinds, with birds singing on the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth. And to reflect that these elaborate constructed forms, so different from each other and dependent on each other in so complex a manner, have all been produced by laws acting around us. There's a grandeur in this view of life with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. Which I think is actually just one of the most uh, beautiful things that's ever been written in the scientific literature, uh, but I will also tell you students that's not a good uh, example of how to write modern scientific uh, writing. Uh, we tend to be much more to the point and dry. So there are two basic evolutionary time scales, two categories, but realize this is a continuum, but we tend to talk about these two major uh, groups of, of uh, events and time scales. We're going to start this semester by talking about microevolution. Microevolution is where we're tracking allele frequency changes in a species across generations. So we're going to be talking about genetic change. And um, um, those of you at SFA should have had genetics before this. It is a prerequisite for the class, but I will review some of this terminology. An allele is basically a version of a gene. So you have alleles for, say, eye color that can produce different eye colors. The gene produces the eye color, but the specific colors can be uh, produced by different combinations of alleles at that gene. And so microevolution at its most simple form is just one generation to the next changes in the frequency of these alleles within a species. So here's a very simplistic example of this. Let's say that we have a population of rabbits in generation one, 
and all of the rabbits in this uh, are white. They have white pelage. And so the typical phenotype is just this white pelage. A few generations later, we may see that suddenly, while still the typical phenotype is a white pelage, you have a melanistic form appear. And we'll talk about the different ways in which that form could initially appear in a population. And then a few generations later, you can't say now that the typical uh, phenotype is the white rabbit. We have an equal number of both melanistic and the white rabbits in the population. And maybe even in a hundred generations, we've um, made a complete transition such that all of the white rabbits are no longer there. This is an example of microevolution. Relatively minor changes across a number of generations uh, in the gene pool of a species. Now the processes that could lead to these changes uh, are uh, four microevolutionary mechanisms that can lead to these changes. We have mutation, gene flow, genetic drift, and natural selection. And of the bulk of this class is going to be describing what these evolutionary mechanisms are um, and how they can interact to cause these changes. I'm just going to kind of summarize uh, very briefly uh, a couple of them uh, in regards to this example. And we're going to start with uh, the example of how natural selection could have uh, led to this change that we see. Natural selection is a microevolutionary process in which we see an increase in the frequency of traits that are tied to greater survival and greater reproduction. We call these traits adaptations. They give the bearers of these traits some advantage in survival and reproduction. And it's important to realize that while there are certain mechanisms in evolution, microevolution, that are random, Selection is a very non-random process because we have predictability of how the adaptive traits are going to affect the survival and reproduction of the bearers of those traits. So we should see, as predicted, an increase in the frequency of these adaptive traits in subsequent generations as long as they remain beneficial. So you can think about natural selection as being a filtering process where it filters out, filters out traits that are associated with low survival and reproduction and selects for traits that are adaptations that provide increased survival and reproduction. So in our example here, we may start off with a population of rabbits in which there is phenotypic variation, and that is the first important prerequisite for natural selection to be able to work is that there's variation in some phenotype in the population and then the natural selection filter is such that in this case maybe the brown pelage uh, reduces predation. Um, maybe these um, rabbits are better able to hide from predators because of camouflage and that increases their lifespan such that they produce more surviving offspring. The result of that is, in the next generation, because of that increased survival and increased reproductive capacity, you should see a higher fraction of brown pelaged rabbits uh, in the next generation. And again, generation after generation, as long as this advantage holds, we should see a, a increased frequency of the brown pelage and a decreased frequency of the white pelage. This is a very non-random process. It's predictable what, what should happen given the selective consequences of one color or the other. So natural selection increases the frequencies of traits tied to greater survival and reproduction. These traits again are called adaptations. And there are certain prerequisite requirements for them to work as I just uh, outlined previously, but let's, let's go through them in more detail. The first prerequisite is individuals within a species have to show variation in their morphology and behavior, and this variation has to be what we call heritable. Heritable simply means that it has a strong genetic basis to it, such that in the previous example, 
Um, if you're a brown rabbit, that's because you have alleles at the pelage color gene for uh, making, um, depositing melanin in that hair to make you a brown rabbit. If you have alleles for uh, not de production and deposition of that, you're going to produce a white rabbit. So there are, there's genetic control over the mechanisms of production of the variation in pelage color such that selection can now operate on this and the different traits can be passed uh, predictably from parents to offspring depending on the genes that the offspring get from their parents. Let's give you another example. Let's say that you have a population of flies and clearly these flies differ in one important trait and that in, in this example is wing size and shape. Let's assume that the individuals with the big wings have big uh, wing genes, alleles, and at the uh, wing making genes, the medium size uh, uh, flies have the alleles for production of that type, and these with the little scrawny wings down here, um, they have alleles for the production of these tiny wings. All right, so now we have to talk about the filtering process. If we make this first prerequisite that there is a genetic basis for this variation in the phenotype we see, does it matter? Um, are some individuals more successful in reproduction and survival? And, so two and three kind of tie together, is this differential survival and reproduction tied to the trait of interest? So are there certain individuals that have traits that allow them to have better success in survival than others, i.e., is there a filter? So we're asking the question, is differential survival and reproduction linked to certain traits and not other traits? So perhaps in this example, this kind of made-up example here, we see that individuals with the small wings can't fly at all. And so food in this habitat is very widely scattered, and so they're unable to make it from one patch of habitat, suitable habitat, to another. So they end up starving before they can reproduce, or they reproduce at a very low rate. So they're going to have very low survival and reproduction. These individuals with the medium wings, they do okay. They have to work most of the time just to find enough food, but they, they are able to mate and pass on copies of their genes. And so some of these genes may persist in the future. But what you may see by studying these flies as, is that the flies with the really massive wings are the most efficient at flying, and so they can get to the food resources first, so they get the best food resources. And not only are they fat and happy, but they have a lot of spare time, and so they can mate more often. And so they're passing on, by far, more copies of, of their alleles. And so in the next generation, what would we expect? Well, we would expect to see much higher frequency of individuals in the population with large wings, and we'll see a greater reduction in indivi individuals with the smallest wings. So that's how natural selection works uh, at, a, at the microevolutionary time scale. Over the long term, we see that there are major changes in lineages that we consider macroevolution. These, this is evolutionary patterns above the species level. So the origin of, of new major groups, new species, new genera, new families and the characteristics associated with those. So the example on the right here is an example of uh, macroevolution showing the evolution of birds from ancestral dinosaurs. Birds are dinosaurs, but along the way in the production of birds from their, an their dinosaur ancestry, we see the evolution of feathers, starting off with rudimentary feathers that we can see in uh, certain fossils that were probably important Maybe in communication, there may have been some color, but most likely associated with thermodynamics and, and insulation. To proto-wings that could have been used uh, to help in, in locomotion, but not necessarily flight yet. To the evolution of uh, uh, 
flight feathers that could be used for gliding and then with additional modifications of the uh, skeletal system and muscular system um, and distribution and shape of feathers we see modern flight uh, in, in modern birds today. So that's just an example of a much a longer term process. Macroevolutionary patterns take much longer to occur. Many, many thousands of generations, not just a generation uh, of minor genetic change that you see at the microevolutionary level. But really it's just, it's accumulation of these microevolutionary changes over a much larger time scale. So speciation is one of these. And again, the long-term accumulation of the microevolutionary changes in these different lineages as they start off on their own evolutionary trajectories. Because once you're a different species, you don't breed with individuals of other species. And so you're on your own evolutionary tract. And we'll talk a lot about that during the semester. So one important tool used to study uh, evolution at the macroevolutionary time scale uh, are phylogenetic trees. And so I want you to develop uh, an idea of what tree thinking is. It's the idea of, of looking at different groups of organisms and how they can become reproductively isolated to form new species. That process is called speciation. So you start off with a common ancestral species that all of the individuals during this time frame have the potential to interbreed with each other so there's basically one uh, species with one uh, shared set of genes. If something happens where they separate either physically or behaviorally and we'll talk about that process where you have two new lineages that are formed these are two new descendant lineages that are forming new species. They only breed within their uh, populations and so they end up getting distinct genetic differences between these two new species formed. So that process is speciation and in a phylogenetic tree every time you see a branch that represents a speciation event. Now notice that in this figure I've drawn here some of these branches go all the way up to the top of the diagram others stop part of the way down. Those that stop indicate lineages that, that did speciate in the past, but that have gone extinct. Only those at the top of the diagram are representing what we call the living or extant species. So these represent extinction events. And how we actually make phylogenies um, is something we'll talk out uh, during the, the last part of the semester by looking at characteristics that organisms share and trying to understand how these could have been inherited from a common ancestor and then show patterns of, of divergence um, relatively close in time and deep in the phylogenetic tree. So let's just kind of use this made up example here of these snails. We have five species of, of uh, extant living species and you may look at these and say well they, they clearly they're all snails but they certainly have characteristics where some of them are more closely related to each other because they are just more physically similar to each other. We can use that logic to build an estimate of what their evolutionary past or their phylogenetic tree was. So we may look at it and say okay well Let's just first break it up into the different color morphs. We've got a couple of, of blue snails and then we've got these pink ones. Okay, well if we look at the, with just in when the pink ones, these two are really the same. They've got the same shell shape, but these got little spikes associated with them. Um, but other than that, they're the same. So let's say that they are most closely related to each other and we call this sister species. That inference is the idea that they at one time shared a common ancestor that was this plain uh, cone shell but the, one of these species evolved the spikes along the way. Okay now let's walk walk that back and compare it to the other pink snail. It's a different shape. Okay 
but it's the same shape as this blue one over here. So probably the most logical pattern is that that uh, more spiral uh, shape was the ancestral pattern and that we see along here, this branch, the evolution of this, these high spired ones. But given the color of this one, it's probably of the, the two that have that shape, it's probably the, since it's both pink, we see the evolution of pink from the blue, which rep, are represented by these older species here. So tree thinking using phylogenies is based on the logic of, of using character distributions to come up with, with a hierarchical uh, arrangement of how species are related to each other to a greater or lesser degree. So the species that are the most distinct from each other um, are, are um, greater separated in time. So we'll talk more about that uh, during the semester of, of how you can use a character uh, set, a data set of different characters of different species to try to understand their degrees of relatedness. Okay, so that's the, the fundamental way that evolution can occur with just an, an introduction, uh, introduction of some of the main mechanisms. But we haven't, as a science, really appreciated this uh, until, you know, fairly recently, you know, 150-ish years. And when Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace first proposed how evolution might occur, it was one of the greatest breakthroughs in science history. And uh, it's comparable to how, how evolution has influenced biology as Newton's laws influenced physics and Copernicus's uh, sun-centered theory influenced astronomy. Um, these all represent what we call paradigm shifts. They completely change the way you, you view a topic. Um, so, so Newton laws uh, and his mathematical understanding uh, really changed the direction that physics went. And uh, really the best example is Copernicus pointing out that um, the Earth was not the center of the solar system uh, or the universe uh, as it was proposed uh, bef and believed before Copernicus. His idea was no, the sun is the center of our solar system and all of the planets, including the Earth, rotate around the sun. Okay, so that, that definitely is a paradigm shift. It, it completely changed the way we viewed our place uh, in the universe. And um, evolution has had a similar impact on the biological sciences. In fact, uh, Theodosius Dubzhansky uh, is oftentimes quoted uh, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. It really is the foundation for all branches of biology, meaning if you want to truly understand how something in biology works, you have to understand how it got there. And that necessitates uh, an, an understanding of how evolution works. So this paradigm shift has led to some consternation among people that don't really understand science. Uh, and so I want to go through a, a, a brief summary of what evolution is and how it differs from creationism or different views of how biological diversity could have come about. And this is important because um, Understanding of evolution and acceptance of evolution as a scientific principle varies greatly from country to country. You can see that in um, many countries, uh, European countries especially, um, this simple statement that human beings as we know them develop from an earlier species of animal, that we are animals and we've evolved from other closely related um, great apes. The vast majority of people in uh, parts of Asia and Europe uh, agree with this. Okay. Very few categorically say it's false. Look at where we fall. We're at the very bottom of this, showing that um, you know about 40% of people say it's true. About 40% say it's false, though. So about an even number. 
And then we have about 20% of people that just say, I don't have enough information to know about that. And that's a crucial point because I, I want to emphasize the importance of education in this regard. Um, it can be done in a way that's non-threatening to people, doesn't uh, necessarily need to conflict with the religious point of view, and the better we have an acceptance of how science works and what science can tell us, uh, the better we are going to be as a society. Because evolutionary approaches really are key uh, for progress in agriculture, medicine, conservation, biology, and so the, the more we let politicians and teachers know the importance of teaching this in the public education system, the better our society is going to be. So let's contrast evolution and an, a competing worldview called creationism. Evolution is a scientific proposition and creationism is a theological view. So let's look at, at some of the statements and beliefs associated with creationism. And that's shown up here in the, in the top right. Special creation states that species do not change, that there was a creation event, and they have basically remained unchanged with maybe just a slight variation uh, among lineages, but there are no new species form, lineages do not split because every species was created separately and exists in that, that way. And finally, special creation states that the earth and life are quite young, um, measured in uh, thousands of years, uh, not billions of years. Now to contrast that, Scientific proposition, evolution says that species do change over time through the processes of microevolution and that accumulations of these changes and geographical changes can lead to lineages splitting and diverging to causing speciation and that as different lineages um, long term face uh, different environmental challenges, we see uh, macroevolutionary patterns forming with new groups forming and the traits associated with those new groups uh, molded by the gradual microevolutionary processes under, that are undergoing each lineage. And that if you take the grand scheme of things by looking at the phylogenetic trees, we can see that as these lineages are diverging, as you go from uh, recent species to older species, we are showing how they're interconnected and that all life forms really are related to a common ancestry. Life is monophyletic. Now for that degree of biodiversity to evolve, we have to talk about um, uh, very long-term mac macroevolutionary changes. So the earth and life are quite old much older than um, a few thousand years old, like 6,000 years old, uh, six to eight as believed by uh, many creationists. So, what's the difference between evolution and creationism? Well, part of it really resides on the limitations of science. Science can't deal with supernatural explanations. This doesn't mean that supernatural things don't happen and that, that those beliefs are wrong. It just means that they're outside of the realm of scientific testing. Uh, they can't be tested. Science has to restrict itself to natural phenomenon. Uh, supernatural things are just outside of the realm of scientific ex, uh, investigation. Therefore, science has to be based on facts. It cannot rely on beliefs. And it's actually very crucial to keep subjectivity out of science because it can sway the way that you look at the facts. You need to have a very unbiased and objective viewpoint when you're doing scientific studies. And belief systems, if you don't keep them uh, out of the calculations, can uh, cause errors.
So let's talk about basically how a scientific process works. A scientist first just makes an observation. Scientists are just very observant of the natural world around them. And then when they see something that they don't understand, they try to make an educated guess to explain how that process works. And we call these educated guesses hypotheses. Hypotheses are characterized by, again, educated guesses that are written or, or formulated in a way that you can collect data to either say that they have support or they don't have support. So they have to be testable and they have to be falsifiable. So the first step after you form a hypothesis, you got to collect your data, then you analyze your data, and then you derive conclusions. And again, all you can do is reject your hypothesis or fail to reject it if the data are consistent. That's basically the closest we come to proving things. But we, we are always trying to take a very cautious approach in science and never say we know 100% uh, sure that a hypothesis is true. We reject it or fail to reject it. With We say it has tentative support. Regardless, what you need to do if you're a good scientist is revise or supplement your hypothesis to test it in other ways. So even if your hypothesis has support, you may have come up with other questions that will allow you to come up with closely related hypotheses that you can conduct other studies and collect data and test those hypotheses. If you completely reject your hypothesis, you have to start off on this drawing board. Your educated guess wasn't very good and you have to come up with another potential explanation uh, and a, a way to uh, collect data uh, to test that hypothesis and see if it can be falsified or uh, preliminarily accepted. And by using this method, scientific data do support an interpretation that life has evolved on this planet. And there is no scientific evidence to support the propositions proposed by creationism. We know that species do change through time. We'll be talking about that and give you many examples of that throughout the semester. Um, and lineages do split and produce new species. And that life, there's a reason why certain organisms share more characteristics than others because they have evolved uh, more recently when they share a lot of traits in common and th those organisms that look very different from each other you have to go back much farther before you can find a common ancestry for those and this takes a long period of time we know that the earth is uh, uh, around 4.6 billion years old and this gives us plenty of time for life to evolve from a simple uh, um, single-celled um, organism to the, the diversity of life that we have today. But uh, while there is support for the evolutionary proposition, uh, special creation, if you want to believe these things, sure you can do that, but just realize there is no scientific uh, data to support these, uh, hy these statements as hypotheses. And these are supported by data. And I don't want to give you the impression that, that this is really a story of science versus religion. Because um, evolution has been judged as compatible with uh, many religious uh, viewpoints, uh, including uh, many Christian principles. Uh, it's been accepted by the Presbyterian Church and by the Catholic Church. Um, and, and many other denominations um, and other religions besides uh, Christian. This is an interesting uh, project called the Clergy Letter Project that is actually trying to uh, bridge the gap in understanding between the religious community, uh, religious leaders and scientists, uh, to help show that um, uh, science strengthens society and it is not going to violate any religious uh, prescripts uh, and so it's a, it's a very interesting project and I encourage you to, to, to um, check out the Clergy Letter, Letter Project website.
All right, now I want to switch gears and um, show you some of the evidence that supports uh, the theory of evolution, because this is going to be important not only for your education, but for you to be able to um, communicate these findings to other people as well who may not uh, understand what evolution is about. So when we were talking about the difference between creationism and evolution, I, I mentioned that there is a lot of data to support uh, evolution. It is a well-supported theory. And it's been accepted by the scientific community since the early 1900s because of the overwhelming evidence that we're going to go through. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, Dubzhansky mentioned, you know, you really can't understand anything without a complete understanding of, of how it evolved. Um, and evolution by natural selection really is the unifying idea of biology. Now that's not to say there aren't debates about the details of how evolution works, but it, they center on the relative importance of the different evolutionary mechanisms. So uh, is drift more important at the molecular level than natural selection? So we'll talk a little bit about those types of controversies. So they're not arguing that evolution occurs or doesn't occur, just the fine details of how it occurs. So let's talk about some of the, the data that support uh, evolution. First, we can actually see evolution occurring in a historical time frame. Um, we can see this with antibiotic use, so that with increased antibiotic use, uh, you see the evolution of penicillin-resistant uh, um, bacteria. Um, and this is because those are living organisms, and they are adapting resistance to this medicine. So th this particularly is a problem if you do not use antibiotics properly. If you do through part of a course of treatment, but you don't wipe out the entire population uh, that's causing the infection, all you've done is leave the strongest individuals that have the genes that gave them some susceptibility. So if you get a relapse, that new bacterial community that you're developing is the strongest of the strongest. And if one of those actually gets a mutation that gives them even greater ability to resist the drug, you're helping to select for bacterial resistance. And this has been shown in many antibiotics uh, to occur with improper use of antibiotics. Viruses evolve too. Um, and this has been shown uh, in uh, HIV. HIV is the fastest known mutating um, entity ever known. Um, and it leads to challenges in the development of a vaccine. Um, but it also leads to some interesting patterns of evolution among and even within host. And here's a, an example of how we can actually use our knowledge of this fast mutation rate to um, track a potential crime. So this phylogeny shown here is a phylogeny of various HIVs among community members in this one community uh, near a hospital, one in this uh, uh, nurse, and then one in the kind of the reddish orange here in this doctor's patients. Now, what happened in this case was uh, a doctor had been having an affair with uh, a, a female uh, nurse. Things didn't go right. Uh, she wanted to go her own way. He wasn't happy with that. Um, he, under the guise of giving her uh, B12 injections, he spiked one of those with um, some tainted blood from one of his HIV patients um, out of spite. Um, and the, the prosecution had to prove that he did this though, and they used science to do it. The idea is that, that she, Trahan, the, the victim in this situation, was injected by one of his patients. And sure enough, if you look at the DNA of the patient in which that DNA came from, uh, it, it was one of these individuals right here, and it, and it had already mutated within that individual, but it clearly was closely related to 
uh, one of his patients. And in, in fact, the patient he had visited the day he gave her the uh, tainted uh, injection. And because the other alternative was, well, she may have gotten contracted HIV from another patient or from just some other community uh, individual, um, but she did not have a close association genetically with any of those copies. She had the closest genetic association with the individual patient uh, that he had uh, taken the, the tainted blood. So that, that was only made possible because these different viral strains have slight mutations in them. Um, and you can track uh, the degree of relatedness by understanding that mutation rate. So you may be thinking, okay, well, yeah, microorganisms might be able to evolve. But certainly we're not going to be able to track any real organism in historical time frame. Well, you actually can. So this is a house sparrow. House sparrows um, are naturally from Europe, but they have evolved in North America after a small number of individuals were introduced into Brooklyn into the 1850s. Uh, they rapidly expanded their range and they can now be found throughout most of the New World, uh, throughout North America and into most of South America as well. And as they have expanded their range, they've established different populations that show a wide degree of geographic variation in their morphology, uh, their size, shape, and color. Now, we know this had to have happened within the past 150 years. So the introduced individuals were uh, derived from a, a small population in England, and we know exactly what they look like, what their size, shape, and color was. And um, Richard uh, Johnston, my major professor at University of Kansas, and Robert Salander at the University of Texas published a, a very famous study in which they took museum specimens of sparrows throughout North America and were able to show that these sparrows are evolving since their introduction into North America. As they go north, as you go north and you see northern populations, they get much larger. Um, in, in body uh, shape. And the reason for that is if you're going to go up north uh, and you're a warm-blooded individual, you want to have a, a high volume to surface area ratio um, so that you're not losing that heat to a, a lot of surface area. As you go south, oh, no, you want to be much smaller. You want to lose that heat and when it gets really hot. So you want to be much smaller with a much larger surface area to volume ratio. Um, also, um, as you go into wetter areas, you want to be darker. Uh, as you go into lighter areas, you tend to be lighter. Uh, in hotter areas, you could tend to be lighter in coloration. Um, those things uh, affect bacterial uh, attacks on feathers uh, and uh, heat, heat uh, thermal reasons as well. So we, we can clearly show that these organisms are changing predictably in a way that would match how natural selection would mold them to face new environmental challenges. Okay, a plant uh, example, field mustard, um, has evolved different growth patterns in response to different rainfall patterns. Uh, even within the same location, you can see natural selection affecting the population uh, different ways in different years. In rainy years, it selects for a growing much larger and you flower uh, uh, later in the season with a, a larger seed set. So the selection pressure in rainy years produced more seeds uh, with a larger plant. Dry years, you don't have that luxury. So in a dry year, there's a chance that you could die out. And so in those years, you want to flower as early as possible and crank out a number of seeds as you can just before you die. Uh, so produce more seeds before you die of dehydration. So after a number of wet years, we see the evolution of genes that promote plants to be uh, larger and later flowering. Uh, and those traits tend to increase in those populations year after year if there's consistent rainy years. If there's a stretch of dry years, however, we see the selection for the opposite traits. We see selection for individuals that have genes that allow them to flower sooner and at smaller size to at least produce some seeds. Well, you can take these seeds from different years, 
and grow them in what we call a common garden situation. So they're raised in the exact same environmental conditions, but they are derived from populations that had, had experienced different selection pressures in different years. So in the early 90s, those were very wet years. And um, so th those that came after that period were those that tended to grow larger and flower later uh, in, in uh, their growth pattern. Those in the early 2000s um, were associated with dry years. And so those that are descendant from those lineages ended up producing the smaller plants that flowered sooner. And sure enough, in, even in a common garden situation, where they're experiencing the same environmental contrast, their genes are telling them how to grow and when to flower and when to seed. So that, that demonstrates that there is a genetic basis to this, and this genetic difference between the two different populations is due to the filtering process of natural selection in the years that they were raised. And when you hybridize individuals from these two different populations, you see that the hybrids have intermediate characteristics of growth and flowering, demonstrating uh, exactly what you'd expect if this was a heritable trait that had been selected due to natural selection. So we have examples of how natural selection affects animals. Um, but we also know that uh, there is a, 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 an analogous pattern that we as humans do to get certain traits out of plants and animals, and this is called artificial selection. But instead of nature being the filter, humans are the artificial filter that directs the evolution of the plants and animals to produce the traits that we want. So we can take a wolf and produce various bizarre breeds of dogs that have certain characteristics that we like, and uh, by selectively breeding only those that have the traits that we like in different lineages. Uh, the same thing has happened from wild pigeons to produce various pigeon breeds. And agricultural species have been modified for greater production, uh, more yield, um, for uh, uh, resistance to drought, to resistance to certain uh, insects. And some uh, plants like wild mustard has been selectively bred to produce very different end products entirely. So wild mustard is the ancestral species from which cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, kale, and kohlrabi uh, are all derived. And again, it's the exact same process by which natural selection operates, except that the, the filter isn't the environmental filter of what uh, leads to greater survival and reproduction. It is just whatever the humans pick to breed uh, and, and what individuals not to breed. So how does artificial selection work? Well, let's give an example. Let's say that you have a herd of milk cows and you're, you're wanting to become more efficient, so you want to just raise those individuals that have the most uh, milk. So that, that should increase your efficiency generation after generation. So let's say that you uh, milk all your cows and you find out that their average milk yield is, is right around here and you've got uh, that's the average, and you've got some that are much better producers and some that are very poor producers. Well, you don't want to breed those poor producers, right? Those are the individuals that are not efficient. They're eating the same amount of grain, perhaps, but they're just not really uh, producing much milk. So you don't want to, to select for those genes. You want to get whatever these individuals are doing. If there's a genetic basis to their abilities to do that, that's what you want to accentuate. So you only breed those individuals. And if there really is a heritable basis to this, meaning that the difference between these individuals and these is a genetic difference, you can accentuate those genes in the next generation and you should be able to move this curve so that the average milk year yield in your um, herd is increased. So that's how artificial selection works. All right, let's move on to talking about comparative morphologies. Comparative morphology is the study of likeness among organisms and why some organisms are more similar to each other and other organisms uh, are more uh, uh, different from each other. This is the study of what we call homologies, traits that show similarities between organisms due to common ancestry. 
And Darwin was the first to really recognize the importance of this uh, as a tool for understanding evolution. He stated uh, in The Origin of Species, what could be more curious than the hand of a man formed for grasping, that of a mole for digging, the leg of the horse, the paddle of the porpoise, and the wing of the bat, should all be constructed on the same pattern and should include the same bones in the same relative positions. So, they, so basically what he's saying is they all have the same parts, but for very different functions. And the only difference is, is the relative uh, lengths and widths of, of these structures. So again, here we see um, the, the four limbs of uh, a human, a mole, a horse, a dolphin, and a bat. Very different functions in these, but they all have a humus. They all have a radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpals, phalanges. Just the relative size of these is is uh, different. Why would they be based on the same structures if if they if they're used for very different purposes? Well, because they all inherited the genes to produce these structures from a common ancestral mammal, and the developmental genes just turn on and off the genes for the production of each individual bone in the relative position to produce the specific uh, uh, trait that's needed. But they all inherited the basic bone structure because they all inherited the basic genes. The genes are homologous among all of these individuals to produce the homologous structures. Really the ultimate homology is what we call the universal genetic code. Um, DNA is the blueprint for the production of, of everything in the body and um, how you get the information out of DNA works through what we call the universal genetic code. Um, DNA is converted into uh, RNA and that RNA is read into codons uh, that UGA is a stop codon in humans and UGA is a stop codon in flies. Um, same thing, C CGA um, is, is a codon for the production of arginine in all living organisms. So this is evidence that the operation of gene expression, the production of proteins from DNA, um, the mechanism for that evolved early on uh, in the earliest life forms and that is evidence that life is monophyletic or it comes from a single early origin based on these basic uh, chemical processes. Some other evidence of, of homologies at the genetic level can in, include inheritance of duplicated sections of DNA. We're going to see that when everything works just right uh, in the process of, of DNA replication, homologous chromosomes line up and swap sec sections, but they, they come out with the same amount of DNA in all of the chromatids. That doesn't always work. Sometimes there's unequal crossing over where they don't quite line up right and one chromatid gets, one chromosome gets uh, 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 more DNA than it should and one uh, gets less DNA than it should. So that's one form of mutation we'll talk about. Well there's one specific copy, the CT1A. Uh, there are two copies of that that are found in humans, bonobos, and chimps, but only one copy is found in the other great apes. So the logical conclusion is uh, that that one genetic mutation occurred at the common ancestor of humans, chimpanzees, and bonobos. Uh, and after we split from the gorillas, orangutans, and the gibbons. And there's lots of other genetic evidence showing that the chimpanzees, both the common chimpanzee and the bonobo, those are our closest relatives. And see, this is just using what we call the principle of parsimony. That's the simplest explanation for how this could have occurred. I mean, I guess it's possible that this exact same mutation occurred in humans, in chimpanzees, and bonobos separately. Three different evolutionary events. But that's not very parsimonious. It's a much more elegant explanation and a simpler explanation to say, no, it just occurred in our common ancestor uh, before uh, each of these lineages split. Vestigial traits are also uh, good lines of evidence of, of homologies. Um, so all birds have wings. 
because they're derived from birds that have flight and use those wings uh, for, for um, uh, flighted capabilities. But some birds have secondarily lost flight, but they still have the genes for the production of wings. Now, they have accumulated many mutations that have reduced the functionality and the size of those wings to make them vestigial characteristics. But the presence of a wing in something like a kiwi, um, a non-functional version of that, um, really only makes sense if you consider that they have inherited that from a common ancestor that had a functional wing. And the same thing with the remnants of legs and pelvic girdles in some snakes. Um, snakes are derived from uh, um, reptiles that are tetrapods, have four limbs. And so some of them just retain the genes for the production of relic uh, uh, vestigial forms of those traits. Uh, humans have vestigial traits as well. Uh, we have remnants of a bony tail uh, because we are uh, derived from an ancestor that had a long tail, uh, which is seen in most mammals. We also have this muscle called the erector pili muscle. Uh, when you get scared or cold, the uh, hair on your arms and legs will stand up, and that's because this muscle, the erector pili muscle, uh, contracts. Uh, it doesn't do anything for us because we don't have enough hair, at least most of us, uh, on those appendages to do anything. But this is a behavioral response and a physiological response that's seen in most other mammals, including chimpanzees. But think about a dog. When a dog gets angry, it raises its hackles, it raises that, that hair, and that's, it's, a, it's a functional dominance communication uh, form in, in dogs. But also when they get cold, those erector pili muscles uh, raise the hair to create a, a better insulating layer uh, to keep the cold air away from the, the body. And so it is functional there. It just, we still have the same behavioral response, but it's no longer really uh, physiologically functional for us. It's a vestigial trait. Speciation itself can be good evidence that evolution occurs. What speciation requires is that two formerly interbreeding populations uh, of a species become reproductively isolated. And then once they do become isolated, each of the populations ends up slowly accumulating genetic and phenotypic differences uh, that can be used to diagnose them uh, as separate species eventually. But this usually takes a, a many generations to achieve. And so the question becomes in some cases when it's actually ongoing, when is it complete? So yes, determining when different lineages represent different species is difficult. And these lineages are actually in the process of evolving. So for example, this species right here, when I was growing up, it was just called a scrub jay. Um, it was in the genus Aphylacum, and it was Aphylacumus relescens. As I was doing work on scrub jays, uh, a friend of mine was uh, doing some phylogenetic work and trying to understand how many species uh, of, of jays there were and what were some of the genetic connections between populations. And partly from his work, we uh, were able to determine scientifically that really there should be at least three species. One, the Florida scrub jay, which is much smaller, an endangered species, very habitat specific. Then there's kind of like the inland jay, which is the one we have here in Texas. Um, and then there was another isolated population on Santa Cruz Island called the island scrub jay. So at that time, we had identified three really genetically distinct groups. But when you look at the genetics more closely, it becomes even blurrier. Um, there is some evidence of genetic isolation between at least five of the groups when you start looking at the individual populations in the western U.S. and particularly down in Mexico. So it really just depends on when you say they are genetically distinct and morphologically distinct and behaviorally distinct enough. They're in the process of speciating. We have lots of geological evidence that evolution occurs. Uh, a lot of this comes from radiometric dating, which allows us to um, assign dates to strata that, can, that uh, include certain fossils. So we know the Earth is approximately 4.6 billion years old, and life started about 3.5 billion years old. 
And by using different isotopes and knowing their half-life, we can date uh, the appearance of major lineages in macroevolution. And so that's allowed us to come up with this geological time scale um, that it indicates uh, different periods where we see the, the evolution of different major uh, groups. This is also, the fossil record has also indicated to us that there are organisms that have been on this planet in the past that are now are extinct. Uh, we have this long-term record of morphological change within some lineages that still exist today, uh, but again, then we see that some have uh, gone extinct, like this Irish elk, um, giant elk species that uh, no longer exists. And these fossil lineages really represent those offshoots in the phylogenetic tree that I was showing you earlier, where the lineages don't uh, go to the current slice of time. And some fossils provide us with a great deal of, of detail about the major evolutionary transitions between lineages of organisms. So within dinosaurs, the non-avian dinosaurs show us the evolution of feathers, first relatively simple for thermal regulation to flight feathers, uh, and then other structural uh, features associated with powered flight. And one of the very first most famous fossils that helped us understand that birds really are reptiles was Archaeopteryx. Um, this is an example of what we call a missing link fossil. I don't really like that term missing link fossil because it's not missing. Here it is. Um, so I prefer the term a transitional fossil. It's showing you a lineage in transition. So Archaeopteryx had many features characteristic of uh, more basal, older reptilian lineages. So it had teeth in its jaws. It had a long bony tail. It had a very simplified um, pelvic girdle. It had a very small pectoral girdle without a furcula, without a keel uh, for the attachment of flight uh, bones, of fl flight muscles, excuse me. It also had claws on functional digits on the leading edge of the wing. This is not something that you see in modern birds today. So it, it definitely had a non-avian reptilian skeleton in many ways, but it was clearly a bird because we can see these nice impressions of feathers. And not only does it have feathers, but those feathers are structurally just like modern uh, feathers in modern birds today. Since then, we've come up with many other transitional fossils, again, that have shown us how these rudimentary, very simple feathers could have been used for isolation to the veined feathers, um, where there could have been some locomotory function, probably climbing trees or hills with a proto wing to gliding wings and then powered flight. So there have been a lot of recent finds of fossils in China that have helped us understand uh, this macroevolutionary trend. Transitional fossils also sometimes indicate, again, why certain organisms have vestigial features. So whales do have remnant uh, pelvic girdles, so they have a, a vestigial pelvis and femur, and we have a couple of fossils that show us the transition of from when these were in terrestrial uh, organisms uh, where there was actually weight-bearing capability associated with the pelvic girdle and the associated hind limbs to a reduction of those uh, to the vestigial state that we see in, in whales today. So that's a little introduction to the basics of how evolution works and some of the evidence uh, to support evolution. The next video will focus on uh, giving a little bit more detail about natural selection.